My name is Bruce Goldstein. I'm discussing technology transfer. And in this segment, I'm going to be talking about transactional agreements that are intended to enable research. So why do we bother doing these transactional agreements? Well, the primary reasons are to share the information or materials. Generally speaking, many scientists think that the materials in their lab are their materials. Well, no, it's usually your employer's materials. Um, so in order to give those away, you generally need some permission. Um, it authorizes collaboration. Um, it's great if you can do a collaboration by handshake, but the reality is, is um, in some cases, you can't. Uh, you need permission to do that. You also need these agreements to avoid damaging your patent rights. Uh, I mentioned in another segment that simply having a conversation with a colleague, if you don't have one of these agreements in place, you might have just blown up your invention rights. Another big thing that uh, happens with these agreements is we clarify expectations. Um, we avoid misunderstandings. In many cases, there, people are making assumptions as to what the other side's going to do and what our responsibilities are versus their responsibilities. Well, if you write them down, you know what those are. Um, oh, and also people, even if you're never going to sue somebody for breach of one of these agreements, the mere act of writing it down and signing it people psychologically take those rules much more seriously than if it's just a handshake. And finally, at least for the NIH, our people and the people that we uh, fund, we encourage it with explicit uh, statements of policy. Use these agreements. Now, there's some major types. Um, the first is uh, the confidential, confidential disclosure agreement. Some people call it the non-disclosure agreement, um, but NDA has, in a clinical context, a different meaning, so we tend not to use that. Uh, material transfer agreements, clinical trial agreements, and um, for the government, it's CRADA, Cooperative Research and Development Agreement. For universities, the counterpart, you know, some people do call them CRADAs, but primarily these are sponsored research agreements. Now, there are some major traps to these transactional agreements that I wanted to at least uh, go over. The first is signature authority. Uh, most organizations have a specific individual who is uh, responsible for signing various kinds of agreements. Um, if you are not one of those agreements, and you, know, you don't want to get those lawyers involved that just slow things down, so you sign things in your own name. Well, that's a bad idea because if there's any breach, you're the one personally responsible, not your employer. Um, so you'll have no cover. That's particularly important for this next one, which is indemnification. Indemnification is a fancy legal word for stepping into the shoes of somebody else for the purpose of litigation. So um, this is only a slight change to some facts that actually happened. There was this lab um, doing clinical trials. Uh, they had intake of, of uh, patients, and as they were doing that intake, they stepped away for a minute. Well, this um, uh, potential uh, recruit was thirsty, got up, walked down the hall. It happened to be an actual intramural lab. They saw a beaker of what looked like water and said, you know what, I'm thirsty, and drank. Um, now, in that particular case, it was harmless, but imagine that that was materials that you got from uh, some company based on an agreement that you signed, and uh, this foolish person was injured. They or their family sue, for, sue everyone for the harm that happened to this individual because we didn't keep them safe. Um, yeah, they're going to go after the government. The government's probably going to be insulated. When they go after the company, the company's going to say, hey, we've got this little indemnification clause in there. Researcher, you sign this. You now get to step in our shoes for putting this dangerous material out there. Congratulations. By signing this agreement, you just became an insurance company for that um, uh, company. Well, it's your retirement funds, your, your own funds that are going to pay for that uh, litigation not just for their attorneys, but if they lose. Sometimes, it's, this is not common. This has actually gotten a lot better because most of the time people are savvy to it. But every so often, a company will try and sneak in a, a way to 
force confidentiality beyond just simply what they give us and actually extend it to publications, to results, and um, occasionally also to bad results. So it's important to have somebody who's skilled with these sorts of things to make sure that a company isn't trying to do that. There's also something called reach-through rights. Well, this is where a company says, yeah, we're giving you our hot new product, but we own everything that you invent using it. Well, that's kind of like saying, um, here's my hammer, I own every house that you build with it. Kind of ridiculous. So, yeah, it sometimes is appropriate to say, sure, if we're using your product and we improve on the product, you're going to get the first rights to license it. That does make sense. But owning everything that you, uh, you create with it or being able to do, use it royalty-free, yeah, no, that's not appropriate. And finally, shelving. Shelving is the idea of um, we get to say whether or not that product moves forward no matter what the results of using our product are. That's, um, that's a big no-no pretty much with every research organization. Sometimes, particularly in the clinical center, a clinical situation, where you are really trying to get that study going because quite literally people are dying. You need to get that thing going and you're willing to sacrifice a lot to um, get things started. Well, it might very well be that if you sign one of those agreements uh, or push to get one of those agreements signed, you're actually shooting yourself in the foot because company can say, you know what, we don't for business reasons, we don't think we want to pursue it, and we're not going to let you pursue it either. So it's important to uh, make sure that the terms of the agreement allow you to move forward in ways that you need to. So I'm going to breeze through the various types of agreements, but at least give you a feel for what they are. So the first big one, the confidential disclosure agreement, primarily used when you want to share some stuff that is not yet public knowledge, um, including your pre-publication manuscripts, raw data, and potential inventions, at least until you've gotten a patent application on file. Um, and you want to do it with somebody who's outside your organization. And typically, when you're within talking to somebody who's like down the hall from you, you don't have to worry about it. This is when you start going outside. Typical CDA, what you're going to see, well, <laughs> what you're going to talking, what you're going to be talking about. Um, there's a duty to mark things that are confidential. Yeah, it's a pain in the butt, but you got to do it. You also need to carve out things that clearly are not going to be included, like uh, things that are already public. And then, of course, how long it is you're going to be keeping your information confidential. Uh, companies want to keep it confidential forever. Well, if you think about a trade secret, how long is it actually going to be commercially valuable how long is it going to take until some better technology comes along that supplants it? So it's not really reasonable to be saying forever, but um, you, you have to work that out in advance. And of course, you need to make sure you've preserved your right to publish your results. Material transfer agreements. The point of an MTA is for non-sale transfers. This isn't a way to get around procurement. Um, you actually are exchanging these things Basically, it's, it's a loan of materials, not an actual change of ownership. So if you read the agreements, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't give you the right to do whatever you want with it. Uh, material transfer agreements are not appropriate for getting material in to start a clinical trial. That's handled with uh, something different. For government labs, uh, not only can you not avoid using it to avoid the federal acquisition regulation and all those nasty uh, procedures that it takes to get stuff in. You also can't avoid gift or ethics rules. Now, an ordinary transfer among researchers, that doesn't trigger ethics rules. But every so often, you have a circumstance where you already know there's kind of an ethics odor to it. So it's best to talk to your ethics officer. Um, I've also given here some various policies, and these policies say different things. They affect sometimes the intramural program, sometimes they affect the grantee organization. Um, 
it's important to know that just because you don't see a particular policy right now, there are lots of policies out there that basically say the same thing. Play nice in the sandbox. Now, there are a variety of subtypes. You might see the simple letter agreement or one that's specific for transgenic organisms. Uh, a bunch of universities got together with NIH to cra craft what's known as the Uniform Biological Material Transfer Agreement, the UBMTA. It's kind of a form agreement. Uh, it's not been as effective as people hoped, but you will sometimes see it. And for material transfer agreements, this is one instance where many research organizations delegate the right to sign an unmodified form of one of these types to the researchers. So yeah, you got to tell the tech transfer office you're doing it, um, but you don't need to have them negotiate it. You just simply sign it. It's important if you think you have that authority to verify exactly what the scope of that authority is. Um, finally, there are some specific types of MTAs you might run across, um, particularly for hem human embryonic stem cells and, and if you're within the NIH, materials of human origin. There's specific, uh, specific rules we have to follow, so do check with your tech transfer folks. Now, there is a form of a material transfer agreement that we do use to get clinical trials started. And we call that, not surprisingly, a clinical trial agreement. Um, but it has some features that are specific to clinical research. So it authorizes first uses in a human subject. Um, it assigns and clarifies regulatory and clinical duties. It grants specific rights for using that data in regulatory filings, and it coordinates uh, publications. And then there's the big collaboration type agreement that with the government, we call it a CRADA. There are other private parties that call them CRADAs, but um, for us, we have a statute that specifically talks about it. So the rules for a CRADA with the government are very specific. For us, it's very broad power, but it hinges on some specific things. First is it's designed to give our collaborator present rights in future inventions, as well as the government rights in the company's inventions, but that's a much, much more narrow thing. Um, basically, the right we have is the right to use it. Um, we don't have the right to take their inventions and go find their competitor. The point of the CRADA is not to do that, um, except in very s extraordinary circumstances. It's also the explicit way that we authorize materials equipment and personnel to move back and forth. And in fact, a number of companies have given the NIH and uh, some of our sister research agencies quite a bit of money and quite a bit of tangible materials. And in a couple of cases, actually capital equipment like an MRI came in under one of our CRADAs. And yeah, sometimes we use the, this CRADA for the purpose of enabling clinical research. Now, in terms of money, the one thing that can't happen is it can't go in the reverse direction. The federal agency, this is not a funding agreement. It's not a way for money to go from the government to a private source. You still have to do grants or contracts or cooperative agreements for that. At the NIH, and this is not necessarily true for other federal agencies, we place a, place a high premium on making sure that the point of doing the CRADA is actually doing collaboration, real brain power from both sides. It's not a circumstance where we will allow the company to dictate to us what the, the research will be or for us to use them as a mere pair of hands. Again, that's not what the point of the CRADA is. By law, any federal uh, employee who is working on one of these CRADAs must go through some form of um, ethics review, but in particular, the person who's in charge of that CRADA must go through the ethics review. And finally, because we're doing so much under these CRADAs, they are complicated agreements, and so they take time to work through. So it's important to get the ball rolling as soon as you have uh, a reasonable belief that you are going to be collaborating with a private party. So I at least want to give you one slide where we uh, highlight some of the other kinds of agreements that other federal labs can use. 
and they're specific to those particular agencies. So for NIH, for example, we have something called a biological materials license where we can physically transfer biological materials using it um, and some other tangible inventions. But only those agencies can do it. Other federal agencies cannot. And other federal agencies have these things like work for others or space act agreements for NASA specifically. I hope you found this information useful. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, please direct them to the program coordinator.